Welcome to the Pedagogy Panels, a series of panels sponsored by the Association of Writers and Writing Programs and the Creative Writing Studies Organization to explore theories and practices of teaching creative writing with experts in the field. I'm your moderator, Stephanie Vanderslice, a, a, a AWP board member, former chair of the Creative Writing Studies Organization, professor and director of the Arkansas Writers MFA Workshop. Welcome. Given the exigencies of the pandemic, it's safe to say that online teaching is on all of our minds. And so we've brought together experts in teaching creative writing online for our first panel in this series. And with us today are Lucy Biederman, Tamara Girardi, and Lex Williford. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Lucy Biederman is an assistant professor at Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio, where she teaches creative writing in three genres, first year writing, professional writing, and creative writing. Um, she is the author of the Walmart Book of the Dead, which won the 2017 Vine Leaves Press Vignette Award, and was a finalist for the Forward Book of the Year in Fantasy category. Her short stories, essays, and poems have appeared in the North American Review, Poetry, Agni, Plowshares, and Pleiades. Tamara Girardi is an associate professor in English at HACC, Central Pennsylvania's Community College, where she teaches creative writing, literature, composition, and technical writing all online. Her primary research interests are online pedagogy, creative writing studies, and young adult literature. Along with a colleague in her department, her research has led to the teaching of creative writing in the online modality at her institution. She writes books for children and her for first board book, Why Daddy Why, will be re released by Familius Press in 2022. She's also written young adult fiction and co-edited the collections, Young Adult Literature in the Composition Classroom, and the forthcoming Theories and Strategies for Teaching Creative Writing Online, which is one of the reasons we invited her here today. Tamara also serves as digital, multimodal, and multimedia section editor for the Creative Writing Studies Journal. Finally, Lex Williford is the winner of the 2015 10th Annual Rose Medal Flash Fiction Chapbook Award for Superman on the Roof and he holds an MFA from the University of Arkansas. He has taught in the writing programs at Southern Illinois University, the University of Alabama, and the University of Missouri St. Louis. His book, Macaulay's Thumb, was co-winner of the 1993 Iowa School of Letters Award for Short Fiction, co-editor with Michael Martone of the popular Scribner Anthology of Contemporary Short Fiction, now in its second edition and the Touchstone Anthology of Contemporary Nonfiction. He is the founding director of the online MFA program and the current chair of the on-campus bilingual MFA program at the University of Texas, El Paso. Welcome to our guests. I'm excited to have a productive conversation. Let's start with the most prevalent question that comes up when talking about teaching creative writing online and that's workshopping. How does taking the workshop virtual affect workshopping? Does it solve or draw attention to existing problems of in-person workshopping? What are some ways to be intentional with peer review in online workshopping? I think we'll start with Lex, but I think everyone has something to say about this. Uh, thank you. Um, I've spent several decades uh, editing my students' workshop documents directly, uh, not just to give them a kind of a close granular read, but to suggest ways to tighten and reorganize their prose. Talk about the structure of things like that. <clears throat> when I started uh, one of the first line MFA programs in the US here at the University of Texas in El Paso, uh, about an, a decade ago, um, they did it with the uh, UT Telecampus program, which was uh, is now defunct. And almost immediately I ran into a wall because I was used to making uh, handwritten comments. 
Um, how can I make comments on my students' workshop documents virtually? That was the big question. I tried several approaches, but settled on one that would retain the exact formatting of doc documents for my screenwriting class. Uh, the pilot class, which I was the first class that I taught, I was the first one on, on campus who taught uh, online. Um, I have been using Adobe Acrobat. There's several other possibilities. People use Google Docs. I think one of you said that you do. Uh, others use, there, there's just more and more of these uh, things that we can use. Uh, but to be able to actually write uh, comments on uh, something, I used Adobe Acrobat, uh, which at the beginning it was very difficult to work with, but it's improved over the years. Um, <clears throat> it's gone through several iterations that have made using the app frustrating. But the newest version uh, through the uh, Adobe Acrobat crowd, the cloud, excuse me, uh, it's expensive, but available at many universities and uh, have improved in significantly. For a while, I made comments on a Wacom tablet uh, <clears throat> used to illustrate the children's picture book I've written, but then switched to the iPad Pro and Apple Pencil, which have been much less cumbersome. I make handwritten comments and edits directly with Adobe Acrobat documents and share those with my students, while my students also make shared comments in an identical document. Uh, overall comments at the end of each piece, as well as comments in the margins that don't clutter the document uh, as Word or Google Docs and sometimes Microsoft Word, Word does. This approach has given students a great deal of specific feedback in the process when we work, workshop either on discussion boards or in synchronous Zoom classes, for example, is especially useful in raising questions that help to move the writer toward deepening their writing and developing it if, um, <clears throat> if it's not clear. Uh, enriching writing and revision, uh, not just editing and cutting, but also pointing out sections that we find most interesting and want to see more fully developed. Uh, moreover, the process mimics the process of revision to prepare writers when they're no longer in school, and basically to learn how to self-edit uh, in the same way that I learned from one of my mentors how to do so. Great, thank you. Tamara, do you have, um, Tamara, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Sure, so for my, um, I, I've been teaching writing online for 15 years. Um, and so that was primarily composition. So for for my composition classes, we had online workshops. And so when I started teaching creative writing as well, I took that same um, process, which I had learned over time to simplify as much as possible. So um, I tried different third party peer review um, programs where students would upload their, their drafts there and then it would randomly like select okay, you're going to read these five drafts, you're going to read these five drafts and just kind of share things that way. Um, students have always said to me that those third party um, softwares have just added an element of they can't access and it's difficult. So I'd really just try to keep it as simple as I could. So within the learning management system, I use the discussion forums and I open... Um, I just kind of manually create the forums. I don't... Um, go through the LMS to put students into groups. Um, so what I would do is I would create a forum that says group A and I have all the instructions there and I'll say group A members and just put five to seven students depending on the assignment in that group. And then I create another form that says group B. So group B can see group A, group A can see group B. Um, and then they upload their drafts and then they go into their group download all the drafts of their group members, read them, give them feedback, and then upload the feedback. And um, the one good thing about the Google, or not Google documents, but Word documents, in my opinion, is that you can then merge those comments into one file. So if you have five different um, Word documents from your classmates, you can merge them in Word, and then a student can look and see all of the comments on one document, which is very easy for them to see the feedback. Um, but I have kind of other um, 
elements to prepare them for this, um, which includes just a list of guidelines for how to give peer review. Um, I also include a list of just general tips of how to give feedback for the I teach a survey genre course. So how to give good feedback on short fiction, how to give good feedback on poetry, how to give good feedback on personal essays. Um, so those, that's what I give them prior to the assignment. And then after the assignment, as part of the ePortfolio, um, they have a task where they take all of the feedback and they summarize it. So that's their workshop summary. And then they have a workshop response. So after they've summarized and thought about the feedback, then they're able to respond and basically critically analyze whether something was relevant to them, why it was relevant to them, um, how they may implement revisions based on what they received. Um, so there's kind of that before and then the, the process and then after. Thank you. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned discussion boards because that's that's been something I've been using for workshops as well. Lucy, do you have anything you want to add to talking about workshops? I just, maybe I'll just step back and speak to this from a little bit of a theoretical standpoint. I'm, one thing I've been thinking of as we sort of begin this semester, um, and I'm, I'm teaching three different creative writing workshop courses. Um, I've, I've tended to use Canvas's peer review feature in my workshops. It, exactly like Tamara said, I find that it's simple and that's, um, that's been really important to me, especially now. Um, I, I've just kind of been <laughs> plagued by the question, how does, what's the pedagogy behind this? Like, I, I, I you know, we have all this sort almost pedagogical, like, lore surrounding the in-person workshop, like the Iowa Writers Center kind of thing that most of us endured or whatever during our MFAs. And this is not what we're offering our students. And I, do I I use a lot of the received technology and I think other professors tend to as well. And I'm just, I've looked around for theory about how, what the best practices are for doing this online. And I think as a profession, we don't tend to talk about this. I, do, I haven't had many conversations about why we anyone teaches workshop online the way they do and i haven't offered that uh, my opinions about that either and i have this pervasive sense that i'm like doing it wrong and so i just I, i'm i'm kind of interested in how under theorized this seems to be that sounds like a great article lucy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh no i have to theorize it <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree. We need to do that. We need to do that. You know, how does how does the way we theorize the the in-person workshop change when we're theorizing the online workshop? Absolutely. That's great. Lex, you had something else you wanted to add. Um, you probably want to unmute. Sorry okay. about that. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that Tamara said about um, the way, the fact that using shared documents, either in Word or in Acrobat, you have all of the comments in one document. You don't have to collate the documents. And I think that finds that students find that uh, much more manageable. You know, they don't have to, you know, try to go through each of the individual documents se separately. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I have, uh, I use a workshop cover sheet to, in terms of theorizing all of this, to give students uh, a choices about, you know, how they want their workshops done. And I tell them about descriptive and prescriptive workshops. I talk about all kinds of things. And I essentially, it's kind of a fill-in thing where they can basically tell us all how they want their stories or whatever to be read. Great, thank you. Um, 
that's great. I, I do that as well. And I'm glad you added that. Uh, Tamara, do you want to add something to that? Yes, I think part of the question was, um, how does the online workshop potentially differ from the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. workshop and, and whether or not it may be um, a better opportunity in some mm -hmm. ways for students. And um, I have seen um, authors talk about that, in the, particularly in the text. Um, but I think what's interesting is we talk a lot about dynamic as um, creative writing faculty of the dynamic of the workshop. And we know that if in, we're in a face-to-face -face environment and we have a strong voice in the workshop that may control the dynamic, um, a, a, a workshop that is occurring um, asynchronously through technology, each, um, each voice is essentially kind of valued the same. And there are some students that will speak up frequently and they'll say that online classes they feel more comfortable sharing their voice giving their feedback to their classmates um, so I think that's something that is really important to think about especially when we're discussing equity um, so mm -hmm. frequently in education that we're valuing all of the student voices and we're creating space mm -hmm. for them through the online workshop right absolutely um, Lucy you wanted to add something to that I, I just so agree with that, Tamara. I think that there's a way to really frame online workshops as an opportunity that creative writing in the academy hasn't had yet to decenter mm -hmm. authority yeah. and to really rethink what it means to have your work read and, and to discuss the work of peers. I'm glad, I'm glad, I think that's a really nice way to end talking about this question. That's great. Okay, thank you. Another, I'm going to move on to the next question. Another popular question talks about community building and replicating sort of, or trying to replicate the kind of community that we come to expect in a creative writing workshop online. Um, what are some ways that you found of, of, creating that community. Tamara, do you want to start? Sure. So I think what I had mentioned about the workshop and the dynamic is relevant here as well um, in valuing all the voices of the community and creating space for everyone to participate. Um, I, I would also like to add that um, within my class, which I think, you know, part of this conversation, the value in this conversation is for us to all share what we do because faculty want to hear that. And so there's right. the theoretical component and then there's the practical component and right. then there's the personal practical component. So kind of talking personally, um, within my classroom, I, um, I created write-ins uh, for my students and um, community was something that I thought about quite a bit. Um, I did some research um, in a, through a summer instructional grant in my institution about community building in creative writing classrooms because when we brought creative writing online at my institution, um, I was the first one to teach it online um, through this grant process and through kind of building this strategy for how it could be done effectively because there are still many faculty members who felt that creative writing couldn't be taught online. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, now we're in an environment where people are kind of being forced into that space um, so they're experiencing it for themselves but one of the elements where I kind of argued we can create effective community is through write-ins and I actually have one tonight at 9 p.m. Um, with my students and at the beginning of every semester I survey my students to just get gauge generally when are you most available when when are most of you available at the same time and it usually tends to be in the evenings usually Wednesdays, I don't know why the middle of the week, but kind of between seven and 10 p.m. Um, their children are in bed. I teach at a community college, so the demographic that I work with, um, their children are in bed or they're home from work, they're finally settled and they're able to sit down. And the idea is that we get on Zoom and we um, just kind of chat a little bit. What are you working on? Uh, what are you planning on writing tonight? And then we'll usually spend about 20 minutes in silence, we're all on video, some students are in their pajamas and we're just, we're writing together. And then we'll come back and we'll say, okay, how did you do? What did you, you know, what were your successes? They'll share their word count, they'll share what they liked about what they did. 
And then we'll kind of break again and go for another 20 or 25 minutes and write together. Um, sometimes at the end of the write-ins, we'll share um, share feedback, um, share maybe a favorite sentence that we wrote, something along those lines. And I create these I create these write-ins at the beginning of each new unit. So at the beginning of the short story unit, we have a write-in. At the beginning of poetry, we have a write-in. At the beginning of creative nonfiction. And then we also have a revision write-in at the end of the semester. Um, when we're trying to wrap up. So that gives everyone an opportunity to, to synchron synchronously see each other, um, to put faces to names, voices to names. Um, so I think that's really important. Another aspect that I that I um, try to, I foster interaction as much as I can in the discussion boards. It's not a place for you just to kind of go and pop something up and not come back, but I ask them several times to kind of reconnect through the discussions. Um, and I think that's really important to try to, try to strategize um, how you can develop strong discussion environments through that. Um, and I think community and rapport are well connected. So I'm kind of going to save some of what I'm what I would like to say about community whenever I talk about rapport, but I think those two kind of go hand in hand. Great. I love that you talked about write-ins because I've been trying something like that. I've been calling it student drop-in hours and I say, you can come talk to me or you can come write with me because if nobody comes and talks to me, I'm writing. But nobody, hardly anyone has come. But what I'm realizing as you say this is that I need to give them guidelines and say, this is what we're going to do, you know, because they're not coming, I'm guessing, because they're like, what is this? <laughs> right. And I write right. with them. They see yeah. that. They see that right. I write too right. and I share with yeah. them what I write, which I think is, right. is really great and really helpful. But they are required to attend one write in throughout the semester. But I think you have to be really careful about that synchronous requirement. Right. So right. it's once a semester um, right. and there are four of them. So, but right. I have really good attendance. The first time I have 23 students in my creative writing class. Wow. Yes. And um, the yeah. first write-in I ever had, there were 14 students that attended. Wow. Okay, Lucy, you have something that you wanted to add. Um, uh, yeah, a couple really quick things. I, um, I have stolen this idea of write-ins from Tamara and I it's worked so well for me. And it, exactly as you say, as a community building feature of a course, especially, you know, writing can feel so lonely for students and for me. And then I also, um, Stephanie, you're, the idea of watching you write, I love that so much. And it, it, Susan Laurie Parks, the playwright, has an ongoing show called Watch Me Work at the Public <laughs> Theater in New York. Oh, wow. And can, I think you can view it online and she's just sitting at a typewriter oh, writing great. winning plays. <laughs> that's great. cool. Lex, you yeah. wanted to add something. Yeah, just briefly, um, I use a lot of exercises. I call them 15-minute fictions. In a, in a real workshop, I give them 15 minutes to do a prompt and uh, have come up with some fairly uh, fun ones. Uh, but it's really good toward the beginning of the semester in general, online or on campus, to help them generate more material. Uh, to, to begin writing new material, uh, because sometimes they'll just re workshop the same story over and over again. But uh, I, I found these to be also really wonderful. You know, I don't time my watch. I uh, When I'm uh, teaching uh, online, I just say, do it this way. Try writing for 15 minutes as fast as you can, and then spend two hours messing around with sentences and seeing what you can come up with, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, let's look at uh, my next question, which is um, the challenges um, surrounding teaching creative online for undergraduates versus the challenges for teaching graduate students. How are these two audiences different? Um, Lex, did you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, I teach both at the graduate and the undergraduate level. Yeah. Um, uh, the creative writing program I teach in is bilingual, so students can write in both English, both English and Spanish. Um, and that's already difficult to sort of manage in some classes, right? Uh, I didn't really begin teaching synchronously until COVID began. And uh, I think there was a bit of a traumatic period for all of us when we were trying to make that transition, right? For those of us who were teaching 
online before, maybe not so much, but, um, and I, I don't know that I was all that successful in terms of being able to adapt, uh, but, but I had a lot of time to think about it. And um, uh, I have been using a lot of Zoom classes for both my graduate and undergraduate classes. And, uh, and I found that the main thing that I was looking for was something where I could teach a large class uh, you mentioned 23 students, Tamara. I, I have 18 screenwriting students. And one of the things that I find most useful about Zoom is just the ability to be able to read their faces, you know, whether they're bored or whether they're really nodding their heads and saying, oh, yeah, that's, you know. And so I can call on them at different times and, and uh, they just have to raise their hands if they want to speak, things like that to, to simplify things. And I think that Zoom has got a much more streamlined um, design for that. Uh, I think I mentioned before that I uh, teach, I taught collaborate last semester or, or during the COVID, when the COVID uh, thing started. And um, I use Collaborate Ultras, uh, uh, Blackboard's Collaborate Ultra, and, uh, and I found it to be very cumbersome. Um, and, and switching over to Zoom, I found to be much more um, pleasant experience, and the students seem to like it more too. Good to know. And so, were you? What are were you teaching undergrads or graduate students this way? Both. 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 I'm doing it this semester right now. I'm teaching an undergraduate uh, screenwriting class and a graduate uh, history of the short story class, and they both run pretty much the same. Uh, but the thing I like about the synchronous uh, business there, they would otherwise be taking my class here on campus. So we have times that we have all decided that we're going to meet. And, and that part of it is it's not too difficult. As for the graduate students I teach online, we have international students all over the Americas, um, really all over the world. And trying to find a way to do things synchronously is bound to destroy people's yeah. Uh, ability to sleep well. <laughs> so so I use more asynchronous classes for that. Yeah, and I think that's good too, to gauge your audience. Um, our graduate students, the graduate students that I teach are all local. So, um, well, relatively local. And so, um, and there, it's a smaller class, so we can Zoom with them. Um, I haven't figured out completely, you know, requiring synchronous zooming with my undergraduates yet, but I'm but I'm working on that. Does anyone have anything else they want to add to that question? No. Okay, great. Um, next question. Um, so some of the most we've talked about some of these already, but what are some of the most effective technologies that you found for offering feedback for student manuscripts? Lex, I know you want, you've already talked a little bit about this, but do you want to elaborate? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's really important to teach writing and editing and self-editing especially. And uh, I, I was very fortunate. I had a wonderful mentor uh, working on my master's degree. He did edits that I had never seen before um, and taught me a great deal for my master's degree. And, uh, and I have sort of incorporated a lot of his ideas and a few other things to make that work. Uh, among other things, in addition to the handwritten comments that I use, uh, I also use Dropbox so that students can share all their documents for each week's thing. Uh, it just makes it easier for everyone just to upload it to one folder and there it is on my computer so I can download them and combine them and, and then send them out for shared review. <coughs> Excuse me. but. Um, I think that having all of the comments in one document make it, make, makes it a lot more uh, easy for the students to be able to, in a sense, balance. I mean, I, I, the last thing I want to do is have my students write committee documents that are kind of procrustean. That, that, that what I really want them to do is to risk a lot and not be afraid and not constantly try to avoid mistakes, which there are none when it comes to writing, I, I don't think. But um, in any case, those are some of the approaches that I use. Lucy, you had something you wanted to add. 
Yeah, this and it really speaks to that idea of encouraging risk in students, which is really important to me as an instructor too. Um, this is such a small thing, but I love using the complete incomplete uh, grading choice hmm. in Canvas. And I tell students, as long as you turn it in, you get it complete. So experiment as much as you possibly feel like you're able to. And, you know, I, I focus very, very heavily on revision. Like this is your first draft, submit it to get a complete and we'll go from there. And I think just that, like that binary complete and complete encourages students to try things they might not otherwise have. Right. Just to add to that, I, I the first six weeks of class, I often do the exercises or other assignments essentially as a, a heuristic to help them develop ideas and things like that. So that the, the first, I would say the first third of class is, is all about uh, discussing brainstorming ideas. And if somebody's stuck, we talk about process and all the rest of it. And, and I think that really helps the students immensely in terms of being able to figure out what the heck they're doing, right? Most of them, for example, have never even read a screenplay, so they don't have any idea what they're doing up front. And, uh, and I think this, this kind of heuristic development is a very important thing. Tamara, you had something you wanted to add to that thing. Right, so I think in terms of technologies, um, I actually have my students create an e-portfolio, which I think portfolios would be in our yes. discussion yeah. in themselves because I did a lot of research about, you know, people that have moved away from them and shunned them and then people that adore them. So um, what I wanted to do was um, create uh, an e-portfolio that would be pretty simple for me to, to look at all of them at the same time. So I created in Google Drive, which at my institution, um, students all have Google Apps for Education. And I created a Google Drive um, sample for students. So there's a folder that's labeled with their name in the e-portfolio. And then um, there are different kind of um, categories that they would, then there would be sort of a folder for short story unit, a, short, a folder for the poetry unit, a folder. It keeps it very, very organized. But then I have the students share with me the links to their drive. Um, probably, you know, definitely by mid semester, but earlier in the semester, as soon as they start creating the e-portfolio. And then throughout the semester, I kind of pop into the e-portfolio and I can leave them comments right there in the Google Drive and just say, you know, this is coming along really nicely. I would like you to explore this a little bit more. They have research assignments, reflection assignments, writing assignments there. So just kind of asking them if they could, you know, dig into something a little bit more. So it's a, it's a dynamic document and a process that occurs throughout the whole semester. And, um, you know, kind of, to Lucy's point, they'll they'll ask me, well, when is it due? When is it due? You know, it does it, and you know, it's kind of if you're completing and you're working on it and you're developing and you're exploring throughout the semester, it, it's kind of due at the end. So um, I, I do have some thoughts about whether or not that's the best approach to be on, to be completely transparent, but I'm still working with that. But I think you, the use of the technology works very well. Right. One thing to add, um, I give my students a hundred for every one of the exercises that they revise. We workshop them and then we, and I give them a hundred. It's only 5% of their grade, but that's a third of the semester. And it, it really does enable them to take more risks. So. I'm, I'm big on that too, actually. I actually, in the beginning, grade their cover letters, but mm -hmm. don't grade the piece. Um, because, and that that helps them to be like, well, I can I've never written poetry. I don't feel like I'm that great of a poet, but I'll try poetry because I, you know, I'm being graded on the cover sheet. So uh, and I, of course, I respond to their poetry, but I don't grade it. Um, OK, Tamara, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, and I want to ask about some best practices for establishing teacherly persona in the online creative writing classroom. And I understand that you have some things to say about that. Sure. So I think that um, this is a question that I was really excited about uh, because the the chapter that, that I wrote for the text along with Pat Bizarro um, focuses on teacherly persona. And this is a uh, an opportunity that we had to really um, bring in his theory 
uh, background, which he he just loves um, to write about theory. And I focus more on the practical aspects. So we have these really great discussions, I, I think. So um, I was really excited about that. And we talked about um, teacherly persona, I think is one area where you can get really theoretical and really think about um, the meaning that you're making with um, sort of the, the parts of yourself that you're sharing with your students, because they only see obviously a small part of who we really are and whether or not they interpret what they see the way that we want them to interpret what they, what we show them, we don't really know for sure about that. So um, I, I think that we have to be considerate of the language um, choices that we make. Um, we've talked about the technology choices that we make, how we give students feedback, whether it's prescriptive or descriptive. Um, I think that's also really, really important. But in our chapter, we, we talked about three main aspects to really be thinking about. And the first is um, to demonstrate teacherly persona from the initial student contact. So um, at the beginning of the semester, um, however you present yourself, just make sure that you're presenting yourself in the way that you really want to from that initial contact. Um, I think that uh, you can do that through the syllabus. You know, in the syllabus, we tend to have language that's very... Um, yeah. Um, kind of very prescriptive, very, you must do this and you must do that. And the persona that we put across whenever we put that kind of language out there from the very first document of the class is, you know, one that students pick up on. So I think contrary to that in my course, I try to use um, GIFs and memes and um, just bring students in and kind of fun, lighter, friendly ways. That's the persona that I try to portray. Um, and that's not the persona that you have to try to portray, but it's, again, just who do you want to be and how are you showing that to students? Um, strategies for feedback are crucial in teacherly persona, because if we're telling students that we want them to explore, that we want them to experiment, they, we want them to be free, and then we shut them down in the way that we give them feedback, that contradiction is going to come across to them. It's going to be confusing and they will shut down and pull back rather than mm -hmm. exploring their own ideas and their, um, their experiences. And finally, I think one point that's really hard to balance is to interact frequently enough with your students that you have that teacher presence that is so crucial in an online course, but you don't interact with them so much that your presence dominates the conversation because the persona that you bring in then again um, places your voice and your power um, more prominent in, in the environment than their voice and their power, which is what we're, you know, in creative writing classes, we're really trying to validate their voice and um, teach them to explore their voice more. So um, teacherly persona is something I find really, really fascinating. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I could talk about it forever. I'm going to stop there though. And I want to hear more. Lucy, you had something you wanted to say and then Lex does too. So go ahead, Lucy. Um, I, um, I'm just thinking about teacherly persona right now and I, I, the kind of control and authority that I can rely on in the face-to-face -face classroom in a normal or, or in the online classroom in a normal semester is not what I have right now. I don't have as much control over my environment or my schedule or my internet connection um, as I normally do. And I think there's always this tension between vulnerability as a writer and writing instructor and control over the classroom and issues of classroom management. And those have really come to the fore for me this semester because it's just so, it, there's, there are so many unknowns. It's such a dynamic kind of semester. So it's just something yeah. interesting to think about and kind of experience as, as the semester. Yeah. Goes on. Yeah. Just sort of commiserating with the students in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Lux, you wanted to add something. Yeah. You know, of course they're, they're grieving, you know, they're going through something very difficult and it's very important to be supportive. 
I, I, the first thing I have in my philosophy of teaching workshops is kindness is the only wisdom. And, and I really believe that this notion of persona or authority, which is something that I've been really fascinated by. I wrote an article for poets and writers uh, back in the 90s called uh, the, the More Democratic Workshop. It's basically about how is it that we use our power in order to empower others rather than to make them you know, step back and, and say, oh, so I, I let them know right away that first of all, it's gonna be very laid back. <laughs> it's conversational, if, if, if at all possible, and that they can be themselves. As long as they could be themselves, uh, then it's a lot easier for them, for example, to search for their own voices and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, Lucy, you wanted to add one other thing. Yeah, um, another thing I think about a lot, uh, you know, kindness and inclusion are pretty central to my sense of my own teacherly persona and what I want in my classroom. But I'm also, I struggle a lot with the sense that that was not really the way I was taught mm -hmm. and I'm a professor. And so am I giving my students an opportunity to become professors if they want to, or if that's still a possibility, <laughs> or am I not? Like, am I being, you know, I just, uh, it's something I struggle with so much in kind of constructing my teacherly persona semester after semester. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Okay. Um, all right. So, one other question I have is about, um, this is a little bit shifting gears, about using videos in the online classroom, video, videoing ourselves, video, you know, using videos. Um, how useful are they? How long should they be? I know, Lex, you wanted to speak to that. Sure, a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit about the technology I use, too, that might be useful. Uh, I've built a considerable number of videos, which I've posted on, YouTube, on my YouTube channel. It's very strange to have a YouTube channel. Just for my own students, but really for anyone. I don't monetize it. I think it's really important I use them. to get it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I focus on certain topics like contemporary fiction, short fiction, flash fiction, things like that. So people can usually find them through a Google search. As for my classes, I've noticed that it's probably best to, I think the longest video I've made was an hour, but it has four parts and the students can basically break it up if they want to, right? I try to stick to 15 minute segments. As for the technology, I really prefer um, Apple's uh, Keynote to PowerPoint. The good thing about Keynote is that if you use PowerPoint, you can also export to Power, PowerPoint to be able to do it. I just think that Keynote makes absolutely gorgeous videos or, or presentations. Um, the other thing that I use is um, TechSmith's Camtasia. Uh, it's got a new version out right now. And what's really wonderful about it is that you can combine things that you've recorded uh, in, say, PowerPoint or Keynote and just put them into the videos themselves. So you have a lot of flexibility, both with the soundtrack and other things like that. And, and I really try to make the uh, these presentations as professional as I possibly can. That's great. Um, yeah, I have I have a filmmaker who's one of my colleagues and and she would definitely agree with you there because she's making really beautiful videos for her students. Okay, um, one thing I wanted to get to that uh, that I think is really important, um, and Tamara, you had mentioned that um, originally when we started talking about this, um, I wanna make sure we hit on is the context in which these online classes are happening, which is unlike the context that they were happening before March. And, and you know, and is something that we have to take into account. Um, do you wanna start talking about that tomorrow? Sure, so I think that um, 
there may be an assumption that once we move online and once we're all in our respective safe spaces that we're able to focus clearly on academics. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're I, I think that we have kind of this these contrary viewpoints where that that might be the assumption or the hope, but then we're feeling something very different. We're feeling that we're hard, having a hard time focusing. Mm. Um, we have so many aspects that we have to think about that we didn't think about before, right. and it just takes up a lot of mental energy. But our students are experiencing that too. So mm -hmm. um, you know there are issues of whether or not they can get on the computer and get the technology and whatnot. But even if all of that is working um, very well, they may have their kids home when their kids weren't home previously. Um, they may have lost um, their, and this is especially a, a challenge for um, yeah. marginalized populations and for women um, who pick up the majority of the, um, the family dynamics in most cases. So, um, you know, we have female students that may have had the opportunity to really focus on developing their fiction and exploring ideas, but all of that time now is they're with their kids who are home from school, who are remote learning, and um, they're just completely exhausted by the end of the day. So, um, Everyone has different experiences, of course. Those are just a few examples. But I think to simplify for ourselves and for our students is, is okay. When we talk about all these different technologies and all of these different approaches, it's wonderful if you want to try any or all of these, you know, go for it. But to also be kind to yourself and realize when you can keep it simple and students can still have a really, really great experience. Um, mm -hmm. When COVID happened, I modified my online course by eliminating a couple of assignments and increasing interactions with my students and increasing opportunities for us to be together. And I think that that worked better than just trying to say, oh, no, keep up with this schedule that we had in place. So I think just being kind is really important. Great. Thank you. Lucy, you had something you wanted to add to that. I so agree with that, Tamara. And, you know, I have a kind of intro creative writing online class that I've taught for many semesters. I run it every semester. And it's just like an online course that I've refined over the years. And I'm it's I'm sort of interested that, that this semester, that course is probably my course that's kind of going the worst. Um, and the courses that I've sort of let and left be open are much more successful. Like I'm teaching an advanced creative nonfiction course and I said to the students, okay, this first week is going to be a planning week. Look around the web, choose a couple essays that you, you want to read in this class. I gave them a bunch of websites to and journals to find essays on. And they're structuring discussions themselves. They're creating prompts based on the essays they've chosen. And they have a stake in this class and what we're studying in this class in a way that I think my intro creative writing class, which is like the effort of years of painstaking refinement, mm -hmm. students don't have that sense. It's like, it, there's sort of, you know, I don't think forcing the sense of a normal semester really serves us or our students right now mm -hmm. at all. Actually, you're absolutely right, Lucy. I'm having the same experience. I have a class that I've taught for many semesters, so I had it on autopilot, and then I I made up the you know I've been doing the other ones, and 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 the ones that I've just changed are going much better. And you're giving me really something to think about. Also, Lex, I remember you saying um, earlier the students students are grieving. And that's yeah. something to take into account. Um, there are also, some of them are ill, you know. I've had students who, you know, who, who say, I have COVID and I, I'm not getting anything done. Um, and they usually end up fine, but I, I, you know, try to support them in that. I've had, I had a student who lost a parent and a grandparent within two days oh last God. week. I mean, within two days. And, and, and who said, I can't focus on anything right now. And I said, well, you take a week, don't focus on anything. I mean, not this class. 
come back to me in a week and we'll talk and we'll see how you're doing. But but I think we really have to acknowledge that. I mean, right from the beginning, this is this is going to be a weird time. You yeah, know, and, and it's it's not going to last forever. Exactly. I also I also talk to my students about whatever you write during this time, keep it because you'll be looking back on it someday. And I think it's important to talk about that and say someday you're going to look back. It's going to be over. And I'm so glad you mentioned that, Alex. Um, yeah, well, okay. it's a very, I'm sorry. It's just a very chaotic time. Everybody's yeah. afraid, a lot of all that. So it's yeah. important to be there for the, the students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know after 9-11, I'll just add this really quickly. I talked about that a lot after 9-11. And later I had students tell me you were the only professor who acknowledged what was happening. And I thought that's just so weird. But I think as creative writing professors, we're used to that because we have another level of, of connection to our students. Um, yes, Lisa, you wanted to say one more thing. I wrote on each of my syllabi this semester, I'm not going to pretend this is a normal semester. Mm -hmm. I just had a line. <laughs> That's a I'm good idea. Going. That's a good idea. And I think we'll end that question on that. Um, okay. In terms of asynchronous versus synchronous teaching, um, you know, the balance in a class, um, do you want to talk about that? Uh, Lucy, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm not, I'm not a very video centric person. I've learned um, through online teaching and then also how focused we all are on online teaching now. I, I, I struggle to pay attention during any kind of video. I'm just not a video person. Like I don't really like movies. And I think we have this, at least at my institution, this idea that synchronous is better than asynchronous um, or that we can attend to our students better in synchronous environments than we can in asynchronous environments. And I don't feel that way in my own learning that synchronous is better. I, I, I really, I tend to find that I feel more, I, I have a little bit of a little bit more control over my learning in an asynchronous environment. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there is sometimes a sort of implied hierarchy. Oh, synchronous, you've set aside time to have this class and that's better than, right. than not. And I just, I haven't found that to be true in my teaching. And I also think um, allowing students to use the internet, in its huge enormity can be really powerful. Um, just like admitting this isn't a normal semester, admitting this is on the internet, you know, to free people from the LMS um, during asynchronous time. It sort of makes use of some of the, the powerfulness of the sense that there is everything on the internet. Right. Tamara, you had something you wanted to add to that, I think. Um, yes, so I would also just say that what's really interesting right now, what I'm seeing too, is that there's some confusion. I mean, we know the definition of synchronous and the definition of asynchronous, but among our students, they can be very confused. In my institution, we've um, used the terms remote and online, and remote is a synchronous um, teaching experience and learning experience, and online is asynchronous. But students don't see those differentiations as clearly. So I think it can be really confusing for students. So setting up really clear expectations, um, I think at the institutional level, but also in our classes is important. And although I had mentioned write-ins as a synchronous element of my asynchronous class, I think we have to be really sensitive about if a student signs up for a class that they believe to be asynchronous, they have a very good reason for doing that. Um, I think it's been mentioned before being in different time zones. Um, some students are deployed. Um, students work night shifts. Um, so I think we just have to be really sensitive. If it's meant to be an asynchronous class, trying to bring in synchronous elements that are required 
um, is, is probably not advisable. Additionally, I think some faculty will think that if we record them, then that's okay, even if the students can't attend. But of course, then there's, you know, ADA compliance issues with the recordings, but also it's, it's, it is, it is an equity issue because there's a difference between being physically present somewhere at the same time and being able to interact and answer, ask questions and then just being able to passively watch a video of something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lex, um, I, I know you wanted to add something to that. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I mean, I understand exactly what Lucy's talking about. Videos, oh my gosh, what a sleeper, you know? And I think it's really important to bring a little levity <laughs> to to your uh, to your videos. I have the one I'm teaching this semester, I have a class called The History of the Short Story, and I have a picture of Kafka doing this, you know, <laughs> and basically start off with the whole notion that the history of the short story is about losers, and they need to have their story told, right? But uh, that kind of levity, a little bit of humor, also makes it more interesting, too. Thank you. Okay, we have time, I think, for one more, um, and I'm going to just ask you if there are other ways to use the web, since you've mentioned that, Tamara uh, and Lucy, the internet to teach creative writing online. Um, if you want to talk about some of those elements, like Lucy, I know you use blogs. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, and that's what my essay in the collection is about, using blogs and creative writing workshops. and. It, Again, just to speak to that sense of the openness of the web, I don't like to teach a class that's enclosed in an LMS. I like students to think about things like literary journals that are online or YouTube videos of poets reading their work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when students can write their own individual blogs for a course, they have this other way of accessing the course material and reflecting on their writing that isn't shut off inside the course. It's it kind it speaks outward to a to a broader audience, and that can be it can make t taking an online class exciting because you're doing something that's. Um, it doesn't feel so much like being a student doing a type of writing specifically for an assignment. You're sort of thinking about how your voice would sound to an to a web audience or someone who might stumble across your blog. Right. That's absolutely. That's really really great for teaching students that um, blogs work really wonderfully for that. And sometimes they keep them going. You know. I mean. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, yes, absolutely. yes, yes. That really is the best when they keep them going. Yes. yes. Yeah. Does anyone have anything they would like to add to that? Other ways they use the internet or the uh, online? Right. Um, well, one of the things I ran up against when I first started teaching screenwriting, for example, is that we're talking about film. And, uh, you know, what I found really helpful, uh, there's a wonderful 20 minute short film that won the Academy Award for short film last year, 2019 called Skin. And it addresses Black Lives Matter issues really powerfully. So I gave them a YouTube link and told them to go check it out. And then we talked about the film. Usually you can show a film in your class and it won't be a problem, but you can't put a feature length film online, you know? And uh, so I, I went to a lot of trouble this semester to give them links to both Netflix and, you know, all the other places that people can go to rent uh, Chinatown, which is a, the, the, the uh, screenplay that we're looking at this semester, so that they can uh, pay three bucks and no more than that, right? They're trying to find a way to make it more or less expensive. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I found, too, that as I as I see things, this is something I do regardless um, of whether it's an online class or not, but if I see something that's going to be online, my students can attend it now. For example, I'm teaching creative nonfiction workshop and there was, and we're teaching a Kiesi Lehman book and there was, he was on a panel and they just put out the link and I was like, hey guys, 
here's the link. You can watch Casey Lehman in this panel. And I've been doing that a lot. And that's mm. just, you know, this is actually a great time for that. Everyone's putting all the panels online. So that's been, been really great. And I'll just say a little plug for you can now, you know, there's lists now on AWP of organized by genre of, of all the different videos going back, you know, that we have through all the conferences for the last, I think, eight years. Um, mm. So there's all kinds of stuff you can pull off from that. So whenever now, whenever I teach an author, I put an interview from that author with what I'm teaching um, and that kind of thing. So that's been a great resource for me too. Um, we have, you know, I think we're going to bring this to a close now. We've um, we've come upon our time and we've managed, I think, to cover all the questions. And this has been great. Let me just say, I have learned so much in this hour. It's been incredible. And now it's going to improve my online teaching. Um, so thank you all very much. And um, have a great semester. You too. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.